guys ready to worship? Now come on, it's Wednesday, and I know you guys are tired, but are you guys ready to worship God? Come on. Let's go. Put your hands together. Yeah.
joy this morning. Come on. Put your hands together. Come on. We receive your joy this morning, Jesus. Yeah, it's for you. Oh. It's for you to receive. Oh, oh it's such a gift. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. The joy of the Lord is for you. Yeah. Oh, say. So I'm trading my sorrows. Yeah. I'm trading my shame.
I'm always when I'm reminded of just how uh, how big God is. You know, we get so involved in our lives. We when we we don't we don't connect with Him as we should, and and we lose sight of just how incredible He is. How He reigns over everything, and we don't. In, in so doing, we don't really give him the opportunity to be as involved in our life and to make such a, a marvelous impact in our in our everyday existence. And I just when I when I sing a song like that, I'm just reminded, and and I hope you are reminded. God reigns on this earth. God reigns in your life. He's got control over everything. Things may look chaotic. It may look out of you know like like how in the world is this going to come together? But our God reigns and he is the Lord of Lord. He is the King of Kings. He is over it all. We can have complete confidence in him. He loves us. Thank you, Jesus. Would you just express love to our God for what he, he means to us? Oh God, we thank you for all that you are in our lives. We just give you praise, God. You truly reign. And we acknowledge you and we glorify your name. We're praying for the, the country of Armenia as we pray through the countries of our world. Armenia is located right there in, in Eurasia, right in the heart of what is really is Islam all around. It's the, it, yet it's the oldest Christian nation, a, a nation that identified as Christian early on, 1,700 years ago. It's, it's faced... Uh, a tremendous persecution, as you can imagine, uh, and yet it has it, it has remained strong. The, the like in so many instances uh, that uh, you will have significant faith, real genuine faith, and then you will have like like we have in our country, people who are really just Christian in name only. And I want us to pray right now for the Armenian Church uh, that they 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 feel such a a key critical position geographically in our world in terms of their ability to impact, I mean, their next door neighbors, their Islamic next door neighbors. And so would you pray for the church in Armenia right now for just a few moments? God, we just thank you right now for this nation. We thank you for the church represented there. We pray right now that you would, you would cause that church to rise to the challenge. They would rise to what you have called them to be and they would become even stronger. We pray for the, those that have a authentic, sincere, genuine relationship with you. I pray, oh Lord, that, they, that that spirit would just infuse all of those churches, that you would cause pastors to, to rise up with a new level of, of commitment to you, a desire to see evangelism accomplished. And we just ask that while they are where there is such pressure against them in that region of the world, we ask, oh God, that they would stay strong. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. I want you to, to pray with me. I'm, in fact, I, it, uh, I've got another, another important request, and it's gonna be kind of vague uh, because it was, uh, it was an anonymous request, a prayer request that was sent in, and I'm not even gonna give the details on it, but if you sent it and you're here this morning, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I can tell you, when, when you utilize every, all of the resources we provide, just like our, our online prayer uh, program, where you have the opportunity to submit a prayer request and, and either acknowledge who you are or not, that is, we are seeing that information. And this particular request was directed to myself and to the cabinet. It was this serious last night. And I want you to know, we prayed over you. We prayed over you. And we prayed in faith. And I'm confident that God is going to meet your need and provide you the peace that you need. Would you pray right now for just those in our, our campus family who are hurting in some way or another? 
Uh, it may be their own emotions that they're dealing with, depression. It may be a result of, of challenges in their family, at home, or whatever. But let's just pray for hurting people right now all around us. You know what I prayed specifically in my prayer? In fact, I, I wrote it out on the, uh, when I got this on email, I wrote it out and sent it to, our, to other members of the cabinet. And I, I, I prayed that there would be individuals who are standing right now in this room who God would give you discernment, give you understanding, give you a word of knowledge. You'd recognize the need that a brother or sister around you had. They may not have said anything, but you, you sense it in your spirit that something's off and that God would give you the courage to prompt you to step out and pray for that individual and be a, a voice of encouragement. So pray also that you would be that person. You'd be that person that listens to the nudge of the Holy Spirit and you're willing to step out and make a difference in the lives of those around you. Lord, you know who this individual was I was referring to and you know the many others that are dealing with challenges in their lives. And Lord, we pray your special touch to be upon them. But God, we also want to own our responsibility. We want to be individuals led of your spirit. We, we, we sense your spirit. We're in tune. We're able to, to, to hear your voice when you prompt us to pray, to speak, to, to be a part of an act of love and encouragement. And we ask that in Jesus' name. And I pray across this campus, we would rise up to that level of, of commitment to you that says, because we're committed to you, we're committed to our brothers and sisters around us, and we're gonna make a difference. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Well, God bless you, you may be seated. Uh, express uh, appreciation to our worship team, what a great job they did today. You know, they, they, they did that, you know, they, I think they do this just to, to get me involved a little bit more. You know, they pulled that, that little old school thing during that, that mix, and I was just about to get going with yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. And you, and you, just, you just didn't give it to me. I, well, anyway, how many of you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, all right, all right, all right. Okay, there we go. Uh, a few quick announcements. Baseball, congratulations to Andrew Ortiz on being named the Sooner Athletic Conference Player of the Week and the NCCAA Offensive Player of the Week after featuring three home runs, nine RBIs, and the series sweep at Central Baptist. Way to go, yeah, Andrew. And then basketball, congratulations to Cortland Blake for passing the 1,000-point threshold to join the illustrious 1,000-point club. Uh, tomorrow, the men and women's teams will face off against Panhandle State University, and a ceremony for Cortland's accomplishment will take place after the women's game, so go Lions. And then worship in the park. Do you have a heart for serving our community? If so, join us for worship in the park this Saturday, February 24, at Friedman Memorial Park. We're currently looking for volunteers to serve on our teams for prayer, hospitality, and greeting. We also want to worship God with the various giftings he has blessed you with. So uh, we're looking for submissions for poetry, artwork, songs, and more. Scan the QR code to join in in showing Waxahachie who Jesus is by volunteering or using your gifts to worship God. Sounds great. And I encourage your engagement and involvement there. We are excited about this week. Uh, this, is a, this is a dynamite week in chapel, I can tell you right now. I'll be introducing uh, today's speaker in just a moment, but I, I would also like to ask Travis Williams to stand. Travis will be ministering tomorrow in chapel, and if you've been noticing also, I mean, this, uh, this great week is going to be wrapped up with Robert Madu on Friday. It's going to be a great, great week, but to, today is no different because you are going to be blessed by the ministry of Mike Santiago. Uh, at the age of 24, he and his wife Ashton, plus three kids in diapers, moved to North Carolina to plant at Focus Church. And since that time, it was, it, I can tell you, church planning is hard work, and both these men are veterans of church planning. In fact, this week is sponsored by the Church Multiplication Network of our, our fellowship, the Assemblies of God. And uh, we are committed to expanding the church. We, one, of the, one of the greatest ways to evangelize lost people is by planting churches. It's just, it's just a reality. New churches have an ability to reach lost people, honestly, at a higher rate percentage-wise than traditional churches. And so I told these guys just a few moments ago, I hope all of you at some point, I mean, of course, we want you engaged in, in, uh, in, in our ongoing church works, but to, to somehow be involved in supporting a church plant 
That would be a, an awesome thing. And so give consideration to that and be open to it. But uh, our, our brother just told me a few moments ago that just this past Sunday, 1,700 in attendance there in the various sites that are associated with Focus Church. And so we are thrilled to have Mike on campus here. Uh, he has actually spoken in our auditorium before, but it was with uh, a, a special event for Fuego Church locally. How many of you attend Fuego? Yeah, but uh, he's never been here in the capacity of speaking to our campus family. So would you welcome Mike Santiago? God bless you, Dad. Thank you. Appreciate you. My dad used to sell fireworks. Um, he was the regional manager for all the fireworks tents that you see pop up before. You know what I'm talking about, 4th of July and uh, New Year's Eve. He was the... He was a regional manager, so when I was a kid, uh, that made me assistant to the regional manager. Come on, somebody. And, and what we would do is we would go to like HEB or uh, Food Lion, Winn-Dixie, Walmart, and we would check on those fireworks tents all around. And anytime someone had like poked their finger through the plastic and taken some of them, but there were still good ones left over, but you couldn't sell them, I got to keep those. So over the three weeks that fourth, up, up until 4th of July, as you can imagine, my accumulation of uh, combustibles was quite large and our family was very free. So we celebrated the 4th of July, the 5th of July, the 6th of July. We had Veterans Day fireworks. We had Mother's Day fireworks and uh, Christmas Eve fireworks, Christmas Day fireworks. We had fireworks for every occasion. And what I would do is I would invite my neighbors to my house and I would open up the garage and inside of the garage would be like the Shekinah glory, the, the, the inner courts, the holy of holies. It would be unbelievable the amount of fireworks that were there. And um, they would say, how did you get access to all of these fireworks? Where did you get thousands of dollars of free fireworks? And, and for me, I would just shrug my shoulders because I was so used to being around something that other people considered super special. What they deemed as novel, I deemed as normal. What they deemed as special, it had become standard to me. And so when I come to a chapel service like this where the presence of an almighty God is and I, I come, come in worship like this, you get to do this every single week, several times a week. I'm like the neighbor who's like, dude, your dad sells fireworks. Like don't get used to this because this atmosphere that gets created every single morning and every single day is extremely special. And I would encourage you from the back to the front to thank God that you get access to something that people all over the world are praying that they could get access to. Can we thank God for his presence? Can we thank God for the president and for the faculty? Hey man, your dad sells fireworks, don't get used to it. Don't get used to it. It happened also in Jesus' uh, ministry. The disciples were around a table and a, a lady walks in and she breaks perfume over Jesus' feet and she starts to worship at Jesus' feet. And the disciples' first thought was, how much did that cost? Because they had become analytical. They were sitting with Jesus, but they had gotten so used to his presence that they started to calculate the cost of the perfume that the lady was using instead of sitting and worshiping with her at her feet. My name is Mike, and uh, it's an honor to be here this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to talk a little bit about our story and uh, share with you from God's word. And uh, I, I thought maybe you guys wanted to be here, but then I saw that there were little scan things at the door. So um, I, know you want, I know some of you want to be here, but uh, really, really glad that you're here. 11 years ago, um, my wife Ashton and I with three kids, we moved everything we owned to a city we had never lived in before. And I got a job at the local Panera Bread. Do you guys have Panera close by? Okay, cool. I think they have a picture of me. That's me 11 years ago, bussing tables, making $7.25 an hour. Come on, somebody. Um, we were broke, okay? Three kids, just out of college. And, 
And I remember asking my manager to not throw away the leftover bagels. I said, would you, not, would you mind not throwing them into the dumpster? Just set them next to the dumpster. And when I clock out, I'll go grab the bagels. And so I'd get home and, and I'd have a trash bag full of leftover bagels. And I would, I'd tell the kids, you're never going to believe what's for dinner. You know, they'd be like, what? I was like, bagels. And then the next morning when they wake up, they'll be like, what's for breakfast? I'm like, you're not going to believe it. We're having bagels. And then they would ask, what's for lunch, dad? What's for lunch? And I'd be like, guess what? It's a sandwich made from a bagel. <laughs> They'd be like, okay, well, what's for dinner? I'd be like, these are pizza bites. The foundation of everything we ate was from a bagel. <laughs> so needless to say, we don't go to Panera Bread anymore. <laughs> but we started inviting people to our house because we knew that God had called us to plant a church. And so we, I would invite anyone praying over their food. I didn't know who they were praying to or what they were praying for, but our church started in our living room. I think they have a photo of it. It was just a couple of us there and we just passionately were pursuing God. We didn't know any better. I was 24 years old. My frontal cortex and your frontal cortex still is not fully developed before 27. And so I was, I was making faith-filled decisions like moving my entire family to a city we had never lived because God had called us to it. And so we would ask God for the city of Raleigh right in our living room. We had a keyboard player and that's about all we had. And it was a cheap keyboard player. It wasn't like the Nord of the Lord right here. It was like, it was a very cheap sounding keyboard. And, we would sing and, and we would ask God, God, give us the city and, and I'm going to make the, the story short. But there were so many miracles along the way where we went from a, our house. Then we went to an elementary school and we went to the Holiday Inn Express conference room. And then we had church in a, in a country club uh, little conference center there. And then we went to a, another community center and then a high school. And then we finally got a building. And, and wouldn't you know that a building doesn't make you a church because God no longer dwells in temples made by humans in hands, but instead he dwells within us. So what's really cool is I'm going to fast forward. And now 11 years later, we are one church in three locations. And we just on Sunday had 1700 people. We are broadcast across the city now. And, and it's awesome. I think they have a picture from one of our recent Sundays. We've been seeing so many people saved and baptized. We baptized 281 people last year to God be the glory, which is awesome. And I, I, I say that not to brag or to boast, but really uh, no one is more surprised than me. No one is more surprised that God could take a punk rock missionary kid from Florida and Spain and plant them in Raleigh, North Carolina and for him to do great and mighty things. And I'm here today to encourage you to pursue God's call on your life. And when uh, Pastor Travis, who will speak tomorrow, he's awesome. He's going to do a great job. And then you have Robert Madu. It's all, it's all uphill from here, okay? This is the, the first one out. I, I thought, man, what would I want to know if I was back in college? What would, I wanna, what would I wish someone would have told me if I was in college again? And I, I'd like to talk to you on the topic of relationships because I think relationships are so important at this stage in your life. And I'm sure that there are many resources and many pastors that help you, but I've been doing my Bible reading plan for the year. And since we're close to the beginning of the year, I spent significant time in Genesis. So we're gonna be in Genesis chapter two, and we're gonna look at the OG couple, the Olive Garden couple, the originals, uh, uh, Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve. And, and, and they, they're in the garden and we'll ask them why they chose to eat the, from the tree whenever we get there to heaven one day. But uh, until then, we could at least learn what a relationship looked like before the fall of man. Wouldn't it be awesome if all of our relationships were sinless and blameless and guiltless? That would be ideal. But because sin has entered into the world, we don't get that. But we can have an example here. It says in Genesis 2, 15 and 18, it says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. Now, whenever you get a job or have a job, notice that your job and working hard is not the result of sin. Before mankind sinned, they still had to have a J-O-B. I'm just throwing that out there, 
Okay, verse 18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. So here we have the first man to ever enter into the story of creation. And he gets told to work the garden and take care of it. And he's given a job and that job we'll look at in a minute, which is assigning the names of the animals. But then God looks down and says, it's not good for this guy to be alone. Can I get an amen from all the fellas? No. Okay. You want to be alone. Forever alone. Here's what I know. If I could go back to college, I would, I would remind myself that there's no pain quite like relationship pain. There's no pain quite like relationship pain. There's uh, financial pain. Some of you know about that. If you looked at your bank account right now, you're like, dad, please cash app me right now. I need a latte. I have three kids. They're all now teenagers and all three of my kids. I'm basically a, an Uber driver and a cash app ATM. That's all I get. I don't get it. I love you. I don't get thank you for raising me in the ways of the Lord. I get, can I get $40? That's what I get. There's no pain quite like relationship pain. And I think a lot of the pain comes from the societal pressures that you get put under as a young person. I don't know if you've heard this yet, but the older you get, the more questions you're gonna get at Thanksgiving, at Christmas, when you go home, they're gonna say, when are you gonna get married? When you bring someone to, to introduce them to your parents, they're gonna say, when are you gonna get married? 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 Maybe you haven't entered into that phase just yet, but in just a couple of years, not far from now, you're gonna, it, the, the pressures from your parents, the pressures from society, the pressure from culture. Wait, when are you gonna get married? When are you gonna get married? And then you get married and at the reception of your wedding. So they don't even wait a couple of days. Like just a couple of minutes after you say, I do, at the reception, they look to you and they say, when are you gonna have kids? <laughs> when are you gonna have kids? When are you gonna have kids? When you're gonna have, there's not, there's not much, there's a lot of pressure in, in relationships. And then you have a kid and you, you I mean, a miracle, uh, you start a family. And the moment this kid is handed to their grandparents and, and then they ask, when are you gonna have another one? <laughs> when are you gonna have another one? There's no pain quite like relationship pain. And, and I think a lot of this pain is rooted in you wanting to live the Instagram, TikTok, YouTuber, fairy tale version of a relationship. And so you start trying to follow the trends of what society calls the myth of finding the one. If you're taking notes, th this is the myth. The myth is finding the one. I just got to go to, I just got to go to Sagu because that's where I'm going to find the one, you know? Somebody told me the other day that they stopped shopping at Food Lion and they started shopping at Whole Foods because they were trying to find the one. And they say, rich guys shop at Whole Foods. <laughs> That's pretty smart, actually. I, that's pretty smart. They, they canceled their Planet Fitness membership and they got a Lifetime membership. If you don't, I don't know if you have Lifetime around here, but it's like a more fancy gym, you know? And the girl was like, yeah, I don't go to Planet Fitness. I don't want a Planet Fitness guy. I want a Lifetime Fitness guy. Like, that's pretty smart. But the issue is the myth of finding the one, I want to switch the challenge from finding the one to move from finding the one to becoming the one. What if we put the, the pressure on ourselves to become the person God has called us to be, to discover the purposes and plans of God for our life? And in the process of becoming the one, what if that's how we find the one? I met a lot of people who are desperate. You would use the word like thirsty to, to find the one. But I've met very few people hungry or thirsty to become the one. And... Our tendency is to obsess over finding the one and neglect becoming the one. And let me show you from Genesis chapter two that Adam was the one before he found the one. The first couple, the first human to ever be created became the one before he found the one. Let me give you four qualities that Adam had before he ever met Eve. Are you taking notes today? If I'm theologically incorrect, there are so many degrees in this room, more degrees than a thermometer. So they'll correct me in your class later on today. Four ways to become the one. I wanna give you four qualities that I wanna encourage you to get. 
before you get into a serious relationship. And if you're in a serious relationship, this still will apply to you today. Uh, in Genesis 2, 15, we already read that, but the Lord put him in, in the garden of Eden and to work it and to take care of it. And the Lord said, it is not good for man to be alone, so I will make a helper suitable for him. So he started working before he ever got Eve. So the first thing is this, is before I find my person, I need to find my purpose. Before I find my person, I need to find my purpose my purpose. If I could go back to, to your days, if I could go back to the days, at, I was at another Assemblies of God school, much like this one. If I could just time travel back and, and choke myself out and say, stop, just become the person that God has called you to be. Stop worrying about going to find your person and start trying to discover your purpose. Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us. In case you didn't know, you were created on purpose for a purpose. And that purpose was established by God before you ever met the person who you think you can't live without. Adam was called to work and to contribute. This was his goal in life. Maybe your goal is something different. Maybe you're uh, an athlete in the room and, and you've discovered that your purpose is going to be to glorify God through your talents, gifts, and abilities. Maybe you're a theology student in here and your purpose is to glorify God through preaching and teaching and, and ministering to people who need the love of Christ. And what I've realized is that my ultimate purpose is to glorify God. That's my ultimate purpose. I don't got any other purpose. Why am I here today? I'm not here to do anything else but to glorify God. When I glorify God, I start to engage my ultimate purpose. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in a season in your life where you were searching for your purpose. Have you ever like, maybe you're in there right now. In college, I thought for sure I was gonna be a rock star and I have photographic proof to show you. I was in a band called The Eighth Hour Romance. I was also in a band called Bethany Shadow. I was also in a band called Saturday Happens. And we weren't a Christian band like K-Love Christian, but we were Christians in a band, but we just sang about our girlfriends, you know? And I thought, man, I'm gonna travel the world and I'm gonna play guitar for the rest of my life. That's just what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna show up and I'm just gonna be a rock star. I was chasing a dream that was not glorifying God. So stop trying to discover your person and start discovering your purpose. Are you ready? Here's, the, here, here's what it goes on to say in, in Genesis 2, 16, 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Number two, here's the second thing I would want to tell my old self if I was in college again. Before I make a covenant, I need to make wise choices. He was told, don't eat from that fruit. You gotta make a wise choice. Before I step into covenant relationship with my spouse, I gotta learn, I can start making wise choices before I have someone with me for the rest of my life. You know that you are the sum total of all of your choices, right? Like, I, I, I enjoy the cookie at Chick-fil-A. I choose to get the cookie at Chick-fil-A. I am the sum total of ordering the cookie at Chick-fil-A. And what frustrates me is that there are some people who pick a lifelong spouse, but you can't even pick an outfit that matches. It's, it's interesting because some of you are, are asking God for clarity and direction on a spouse and you won't even wake up to go to church. <laughs> And this is what the Bible says in Luke 16, 10. Remember, I'm just talking to myself. I'm not, I don't know, you guys are all good, but I'm just reminding myself. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with very much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with very much. See, integrity shows up in the small things. Let me give you things that I wish they would have told me in college. Can I tell you what they are? Very practically, integrity shows up in the small things. Number one, spiritual disciplines, which you're getting a master class in spiritual disciplines by having chapel and all these things, prayer, worship, fasting, time management. Come on, somebody. Marriage is not gonna make you more punctual, okay? If you're late now, you'll probably be late later. 
Financial management. I'm sure that there are resources here at this school that will teach you. I'm sure that the church that you attend probably offers some sort of financial peace university or something like that. Learn to manage your finances. Emotional intelligence. Learn when to, to leave uh, the conversation, let it rest, you know? Learn when to say no. <laughs> Learn when to stop talking if you're talking too much. Catch yourself when you take advantage of, of certain things. And then self-leadership and all of these things get taught here. So I'm not here to harp on any of those things. But those would be the qualities that I would start to work on. If you're like, I want, I want God to send me a person, I would say become this person who's spiritually disciplined, good with time management, financial management, emotionally intelligent, and self-leadership. See, because marriage is not a magnifier. Marriage is a magnifier, not a solution. It's a magnifier. <laughs> it's like the lottery. If you won the lottery today, which you shouldn't play or gamble, but if you did win the lottery today, it would simply magnify your current financial practices. It wouldn't fix your current financial practices. Marriage is the same way. Marriage doesn't change you. It simply magnifies who you are. God says that he would make a helper. Turn to your neighbor and say, er. See, that's what, that's what a spouse will do. It will add the er. So if you're broke now, when you get married, you'll be broke. <laughs> if you're lazy now, you'll be lazy. <laughs> All right. So my, my encouragement to you is to make wise choices now. The Bible says, the half-brother of Jesus, James says, if you lack wisdom, ask for it. Make wise choices now. Now let's go to the third one. Verse 19, now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought to them a man to see what he would name them. So now Adam has a job. He's naming all of the animals and whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So if you don't like the name of any of the animals on earth, you can blame Adam. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. This is the first time in the scriptures that we go from hearing the man to actually hearing Adam's name. This is fascinating because he goes from a man to Adam. So now he has a name and a job, and Eve is still not in the picture. Number three is this, before I seek out intimacy, I need to seek out my identity. I need to know who I am before I go seeking out another person. I'm helping somebody today. I'm saving you a lot of heartache today. You need to know who you are. You need to know who you are, and it's, it's okay for you to be single and secure. He was Adam before he ever met Eve. So men, you don't need to have a woman to be a successful man. You can be single and secure. Don't let the locker room talk or the competition talk try to coach you into doing something that is not of God. You can be who you are. You can get a job and know who you are before you ever meet the person in your life. Women, you don't need to be you don't need a man to be single, secure, and a confident woman. Here's how I can prove that to you. I can prove to you that Eve, Eve actually knew who God was before she met Adam. It says in Genesis 2, then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he, speaking of God, brought her to him. Isn't that interesting? Who did Eve meet first? She met God first before she met Adam. Some of you are here seeking a husband, but you need to be seeking the Holy Ghost because Eve met God before she met Adam and God brought Eve to Adam. I am setting some people free. I know I'm supposed to talk about church planning. I felt like I did that already, but I, right now at this stage in your life, who you marry matters so much. All right. Number four, before I pursue a relationship, I must pursue rest. I must pursue rest. The keyboard player can come back to make me sound more spiritual than I already am. Is he here? Thank you so much, man. You're a gift to the kingdom of God. Thank you so much. Make me sound way more spiritual. Yeah.
Before I pursue relationship, I pursue rest. It says in verse 21, so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Adam found the one when he started pursuing a relationship with God that involved so much security that he could rest in the presence of God. That's why I love chapel. I love chapel because it's developing in you a pattern of rest. Now, some of you are asleep right now while I'm preaching and I think that's fine, whatever, if you feel like this is a good place. But I'm not talking about sleep. I'm talking about rest. I'm talking about a seated identity that says, I know who I am because God created me this way. I know who I am because I get into the presence of God multiple times of week at chapel and in uh, dorm devotions and at my local church. I know who I am. I don't need someone to tell me who I am. I'm seated and rested in righteousness. I'm clothed by the power of the Holy Spirit and I'm not proud, but I'm confident in this, that I am who God says I am, that I am not what the world tells me I need to be or who the world tells me I need to be or what the pressures that society, I'm rested in God. I'm, your opinion of me matters secondary, very little in replace of the opinion of God. And my Bible says that he delights himself. My Bible says that he dances over me. My Bible says that before I was ever even born. He formed me in my mother's womb. My Bible says that he has the hairs on my heads numbered, numbered. Do you know what that means? That means that it's, he doesn't know how many he has each of them numbered. If I were to pluck a, a, a one hair out right now, he wouldn't not just know the total. He would know which one he would be like, that's 500,627 and decreasing with my stress level. My, my daughter's here with me. She just got her license. So please pray in the spirit for me. And you, next time you see me, my hair will be further back. Whew, praise God. Psalm 62, five says this. Yes, my soul find rest in God. My hope comes from him. When's the last time you just said, you know what, God? I'm gonna stop trying to force things to happen and I'm just gonna hope in you. I'm gonna let my rest be in you. And as I become the person you've called me to be, you will send me the person you have for me. See, until I am satisfied in God, I will never find true satisfaction in anything else. See, most people that go from relationship to relationship, uh, boyfriend, boyfriend, girlfriend to girlfriend, they, they're, they're uneasy and unsettled in their identity in God. And because of that, they jump from thing to thing. But you must be satisfied in God. You have to find time to tell your feelings not to be so frantic. And if you're single today, or if you're looking for someone, I would encourage you to say to yourself, at this season in my life, I don't need them, I need him. I don't need what the world pressures is putting on me. I don't need what everyone else says I have to do. I just need the presence of God. I wanna hunger and thirst for righteousness. I wanna be a person that needs the presence of God. I want not to have my spirit in such a way that God cannot minister and speak to me today. So with the last few minutes that we share together, I'm gonna invite the band, I'm gonna ask you to stand and I'm gonna ask that you would just lift your hands. I'm gonna ask that you would stand to your feet and I'm gonna ask that you would just begin to find rest in God. I'm gonna ask that you would begin to find your identity in Christ. I'm gonna ask that you would stop trying to find the one and start becoming the one right now. Would you just lift your hands to heaven all across this room? Would you just lift your hands and just give God some praise and just worship him and just say, thank you, God, for the plans and the purposes that you have for my life. 
Thank you, God, for your presence. Thank you for bringing me to this campus on this day so that I could find rest and hope in you. Maybe you've been striving, you've been trying, and you just needed to be reminded today that it's not about finding the one, it's about becoming the one today. We worship you, Father. We praise your name. We give you all glory, all honor, and all praise. Would you begin to out loud just say, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I praise you. Come on, just make this a place of, of worship and a place of praise. God, I, I, love your, I love your name. You're a good God. You're a mighty God. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for keeping me safe. Be with my family today, Lord. Order my steps today. Every class I go to, every interaction I have, every time I, 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 I walk through the, the halls, oh God, I just pray that you would go before me, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would make me the man of God you've called me to be. I pray that you would make them the woman of God that you've called them to be, oh God. I pray that before they step into covenant, that today would be a day of wise choices. We love you, Jesus. We praise you. We worship you. We magnify you. With the last couple of minutes that we have, can we just sing a song together? Come on, sing it like it's the last song you're ever going to sing on earth. Come on, let's put our trust in him. Sing it out loud. Sing it like it's the last time you're ever going to sing here on earth. What a great message. What a great message. God loves you. I think you believe that. I love you. I think you believe that. The question is, do you love you? Do you love who you are, where you are? See what Pastor Santiago just gave to us was an invitation to take the mask off. You've heard me say before in class, a hypocrite is not necessarily 
what we often think they are. It was a it was a theatrical actor who wore something in front of their face so that you would think they were something they were not. And I just encourage you today to take this message and use the points. It's a process. It's not going to happen overnight, but it's a process of figuring out who you are and being okay with who you are and allowing God to use you for the purposes that he created you to be. So you can live in freedom and you can live in integrity. You don't have to be like everybody else. You need to be who God has created you to be. And that's freedom. That's freedom if you can ever get there. And until you are that, as he said, there is no right reason to worry about a relationship with somebody else because you don't want to present yourself as something you're not. Today we are in the first of two days of the Church Multiplication Network Church Planting. I want to uh, thank Dr. Odell for uh, running our church planting program here at the school. I know, I know it's not big, but I just want to say that this is one of those opportunities that every one of us here in this room can be involved in. Church plants need teachers. They need business people. They need people who can lead in athletics. They need, they don't need just a preacher. They need all the rest of us. And I just encourage you, as Dr. Bridges did earlier, consider, okay, consider maybe God wants you not to go to Africa, but maybe he wants you to go to Raleigh, North Carolina, or he wants you to go to someplace else that's a church plant. There's opportunities all over the place for you. Those of you who were invited to go to dinner with us tonight, it'll be at five o'clock at Tuscan Slice. So I just want to, I, I think we're kind of fuzzy on the time. That would be five o'clock. Um, but let's once again give a thanks to Pastor Mike as we get done. Father, I pray that you would just bless this uh, congregation of, of students, Lord, that you would just help all of us, starting with me, to be able to be who I am in you, to know your purposes, to be able to rest in you, to be able to rely on you. Father, I pray right now, by your Holy Spirit, that you will seal what was said today and that you'll make it an active part of our lives. Jesus, we thank you and we ask these things in your precious name. Amen. See you tomorrow.